I'm calling this series Answering Gosticles. Because as I travel around Canada, the United States, teaching and speaking, the vast majority of questions that I get from unbelievers, like atheists, skeptics, people from other world religions, is what I call a a gospel. Everyone say gospel. <laughs> Try and say that five times fast. Okay, not easy. I was told to pick on the junior hires. What do you think? A go- Are you guys junior hires? What do you think a gospel is? Hit me with it. You are smarter than you look. No. <laughs> I was also told to pick on the junior hires. No, good job. A gospel is an obstacle of the gospel. Did you guys know there's obstacles of the gospel out there? These are obstacles that get in the way from someone accepting the gospel. Maybe you've sat down with your unsaved uncle or aunt, and you want to tell them about Jesus. So you start talking about Jesus, and they bring up contradictions in the Bible. And you're thinking, no, 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 I want to talk to you about Jesus. But, they're, but they're, their question to you is, well, isn't Jesus in that outdated book that's full of contradictions? So the Bible becomes a gospel. Um, things like science, we're going to look at this next week. Science, for some people, is a gospel. What do I mean? You know, you're talking with your unsaved grandfather or, or grandmother, and you start talking about Jesus, and they bring up evolution, or they bring up the Big Bang, or something like that. They'll argue that faith is at odds with science. Belief in God, that's at odds with science. Science is a gospel for some people. Uh, the problem of evil. How about the evil done in the Old Testament? How could a loving God command the Israelites to completely wipe out the Canaanites? Have you read those accounts? Evil can be a gospel for some people. How about the exclusivity of Christ or the existence of hell? These are gospels. How could a loving God send someone to hell for eternity? What about those who have never even heard of Jesus Christ? What happens to them? The exclusivity of Christ and hell, they can be gospels, okay? And so we're going to take on all of these challenges over the next uh, four weeks. In our time together tonight, I want to take on that first one. The first one is, is the Bible full of contradictions? Did you guys know the Bible is not the easiest book to read? It really is not the easiest book to read. There's actually three kinds of difficult sayings in the Bible. The first is difficult sayings, uh, sayings that are difficult to understand. There's also sayings that are difficult to accept. And then there are some sayings that are just difficult to reconcile. What about those difficult to understand? Uh, after, re- after feeding the 5,000, Jesus says to his disciples this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. How's that for difficult to understand? In fact, in that time, after he had said that, his own disciples said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? That's what they said. In fact, if you go to the end of the account, it says this. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Difficult sayings, difficult to understand. These are gospels. How about this one? Difficult to accept. There are some things we understand, but we just find it hard to accept. We understand things like Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But that, for some people, is hard to swallow. Many people find this exclusivist language hard to believe. How can Jesus be the only way? The only way. So there is difficult to accept, difficult to understand, But this is what we're going to focus on tonight. There are some sayings that are difficult to reconcile, okay? This this raises the question of the internal consistency of the Bible itself. And so uh, these are often called contradictions. It doesn't take long to speak to an unbeliever before they start bringing up so-called contradictions in the Bible. Here's one, just an example. Uh, 
how did Judas Iscariot die? Well, if you read Matthew, it says this, and throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. Okay, Matthew's clear. He hanged himself. But then you read the book of Acts. This is Luke's account. And Luke says this, Now this man, speaking of Judas, acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, head first. He burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. I'm glad we already ate, right? Huh. Huh. These two accounts of the death of Judas seem to be in conflict with each other. Many would argue that these are contradictory accounts. What do we say to something like this? This is what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, oftentimes, skeptics and atheists will make the claim that the Bible is full of contradictions. But, when people make this claim, we as Christians, as clear-thinking Christians, shouldn't let that claim stand. Now, your impulse is going to be to say, no, 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 the Bible doesn't have contradictions. That's going to be your impulse. What you need to do is ask a question. Someone says the Bible's full of, of contradictions. Your question immediately should be, can you give me some examples? Can you give me some examples? How did you come to that conclusion is essentially what you're asking. Now, sadly, most people who make the claim, this has been my own experience, if you're face-to-face -face with them and you say, can you give me some examples? It's full of them? Okay, give me ten. You won't get one. Okay, you won't get one. That's if you're face to face. Now, if you try that on Facebook, if you try that on uh, Twitter, what, what will happen is they won't know, but they'll go to Google Bible contradictions and they'll find thousands. Let me show you uh, a few of those in a minute. Now, if if the person is is uh, is bright, they will know a few offhand. I want to show I want to show a clip of Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is a textual critic, probably one of the most famous in the world. He is also a professor, okay, at Chapel Hill. And uh, he just, in almost every single one of his debates, debating over the reliability of the Gospels and the Bible, he brings up contradictions. This is just a short clip uh, of what he likes to do. There are discrepancies in the resurrection narratives of the New Testament. I have my, dis I have my, my, my disciples, <laughs> my disciples at Chapel Hill, do this uh, assignment every, uh, every year. Just read what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say about the resurrection and make a list of what each one says and compare your list. Who goes to the tomb? Is it one woman or several women? What are their names? It depends which gospel you read. Was the stone already rolled away before they got there? It depends which gospel you read. What did they see there? <coughs> did they see a man there? Did they see two men there? Or did they see an angel there? It depends which gospel you read. Were, what were they told to do? It depends which gospel you read. Did they do it? it? Depends which gospel you read. Were the disciples supposed to go to Galilee to see Jesus and they did so? Or were they ordered not to leave Jerusalem? And they did so. These are discrepancies. They're not simply differences. Why? Because they are different stories. But if they're different, they can't be accurate. So you heard it from him. Uh, you heard it from the horse's mouth here. Bart says that there are discrepancies. There are discrepancies. They are not simply differences. Why? Because they're different stories. But if they're different, then they can't be accurate. So if there's these contradictions, these discrepancies, then, then the New Testament specifically cannot be accurate. Now, what does he mean by discrepancy? What does he mean by discrepancy? Well, I looked it up in the dictionary just to be safe. And a discrepancy is a lack of compatibility between two or more facts. And so that means two or more facts are not compatible. They contradict each other. Okay, Bart Ehrman is saying that the Bible is full of contradictions. In fact, the talk on YouTube is called Bible Contradictions. Um, and we'll be looking at this video uh, throughout the presentation. Now, he's not the only one who thinks as much. How many of you have seen this graphic before? 
Has anyone seen this? Okay, there's one of you. If you Google Bible contradictions, you will stumble upon this graphic. What you are looking at is every single chapter of the Bible. The white is the Old Testament, and then we get over here, that's the gray, that's the New Testament. Every rainbow you see starts one place at one verse and ends at another verse. And the claim is every single bow you see on this graphic is a contradiction. Okay? Is a contradiction. So there's contradictions within the Old Testament. There's contradictions within the New Testament. And then there are contradictions that go from the Old Testament into the New Testament. That's a lot of contradictions. In fact, they list them. There are about 440 on this one graphic. Does anyone feel uncomfortable? I hope so. All right, so... There, uh, so, so this is this is the kind of thing that's out there. This is the kind of thing that's out there. We need to we need to be careful to define what we mean by a contradiction. The word gets thrown around uh, by unbelievers when talking about the Bible all the time, but we need to to distinguish between a genuine contradiction, which cannot be resolved. Uh, it's impossible to reconcile, and a mere difference which uh, is possible to reconcile, okay? So the difference between a contradiction and a difference. One can be reconciled and one can't be. Now, uh, to illustrate this, let me tell you about the Titanic. In, two uh, in 2000, in 1912, 2012, in 1912, the Titanic, the Titanic sank. Big boat, 800 feet long, and eyewitnesses, who saw the boat sink had conflicting testimonies. Some eyewitnesses said the boat sank in one piece. Other eyewitnesses said it broke in two and then the two pieces sank. How you can get this wrong, I don't know. But these are contradictory accounts that cannot be reconciled, okay? So that's an, an example of a contradiction. Let me tell you another story. Consider my wife winning the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. This is not a true story. When I get home from work, she explains what happened. She says, around noon, the doorbell rang, and I went to the door, and there was a man holding a giant check for a million dollars. That's what she tells me. And then I hear her talking with her mom on the phone an hour later, explaining what happened. Okay, and this is what she says to her mother. At 12.10 p.m., I was right in the middle of making lunch, and the doorbell rang. I ran and got Allison because the doorbell woke her up from her nap. I wasn't impressed. But when I answered the door, there was a man holding a giant check for a million dollars and another man recording the whole thing on live TV. At first, I thought this was a big joke, but when I realized it was for real, I started crying with joy. Now, are those two accounts contradictory I actually didn't say anything contradictory in those accounts one was just giving way more detail than the other one gave more precise details than the other and so this is the kind of thing we're going to see in in the gospel in the gospels notice that many of the difference in these two stories are differences but they're not they're not contradictory okay it would it would have been an issue if I my wife got off the phone with her mother and I said you stinking liar, right? You lied. No, she didn't lie. You contradicted yourself. No. So many of these alleged contradictions that arise, uh, arise because we apply an unfair uh, standard or expectation to the Bible, okay? Uh, what can happen is we just assume that the biblical authors wrote just as we do today in the 21st, 21st century, and then we end up applying our 21st century standard to a, in the case of the New Testament, a first century document. And that would be a gross mistake. In fact, listen, most claims of Bible contradictions stem from the reader misunderstanding the author's intent. Okay, If you didn't get anything else 
uh, in this lesson, this is how most contradiction, alleged contradictions come out. It's the reader who misunderstands the author's intent. Sometimes they misunderstand it. Sometimes they just misrepresent it, okay? That can happen too. So the error stems in the reader, not the author. Some of those false expectations are things like what you see on the screen. An author selects some facts. They take that to mean a denial of things they didn't select. Well, look at those. Uh, for an author to be accurate, they must also be precise. That's a false expectation. Ordering events has to always be chronological. That's a false expectation. Time compressing a story or summarizing a story is errant. That's a false expectation. And mysteries in the Bible, real mysteries in the Bible, are irreconcilable. That is a false expectation, okay? So let's look at some of these. Many people reading the Bible think that every event needs to be like as if it's recorded on a high-definition recording uh, device of the events. That's only 720p. We should be in 4K now, right? But that's unrealistic. That's unrealistic. They didn't have that kind of technology. They didn't think the way we do in the 21st century. The events in the Bible were written by different people from different perspectives, and they had different themes or purposes in mind when they wrote. So I want to do my best to give you uh, five helpful principles that will help you deal with these kinds of challenges when they come up from other people or when you're just reading the Gospels or the Bible yourself. Okay, we don't have time to go through every single alleged contradiction. As you've seen, there are many. And so uh, I'm going to give you the principles, but I also want to let you know about some resources. Okay, one is the Big Book of Bible Difficulties by Norm Geisler and Tom Howe. I've had them both as professors. They are smart guys. They used to be called When Critics Ask. This book has over 800 Bible difficulties in it. Okay. It's something like 700 pages. So if you don't want to know the answer to, if you want to know the answer to every single one of these kind of challenges, they're all kind of in there. Here's the problem. Here's the solution. There's other books. The most recent one that I've picked up is this one. It's called the Holman Apologetic Commentary on the Bible. They've only written one for the Gospels and Acts, but they're going to do the whole Bible. This is over 750 pages. And it's written by brilliant scholars. They go through essentially Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the, and the, uh, the book of Acts. Looking at those uh, supposed contradictions. The last thing that's not on the screen is everyone should own a harmony of the Gospels. Um, basically what this book does is it, it will put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together in kind of a chr chrono chronological order. And you can read the account right next to each other, okay? So here's what Matthew said right next to what Mark said when they're telling the same story. Uh, that's really helpful when you're trying to deal with these kinds of uh, issues. Okay, let's go. So helpful principle, number one. The first false expectation that leads people to believe there's contradictions in the Bible is that selection or omission is a denial, um, it shouldn't need to be said, but authors can't write everything, right? They have to select from certain things. They select what they write. Even, the, even John admits this in his own gospel. Uh, John, at the very end, chapter 21, 20, verse 25, says, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them written? I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Okay, he's speaking hyperbolically. Um, but you get the idea. There's lots of things we couldn't put in the book, right? The author selects the content that's relevant to his purpose. When the author selects certain events to record, he has to leave out other things. That's just the nature of being an author. And so one of these, one of these kinds of uh, stories that affects this particular principle, that we can use this principle for, is uh, the description of the women discovering the empty tomb. How many women discovered the empty tomb? Was it one, two, three, or more? Depends which gospel you read, right? So the Apostle John, he names Mary Magdalene specifically in John 20, verse 1. Uh, he says this, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came uh, to the tomb early, while it was still dark, 
and he saw the, the stone had been uh, taken away from the tomb. Now, this is actually a literary device. It's, uh, they apply it in Greco-Roman biographies. It's called spotlighting. John is zooming in. You guys have probably been to a play before. They got the spotlights going. There could be lots of people on stage, but the spotlight is on one person. Remember, selectivity, selection, is not a denial. That's our first principle. John selects Mary, Magdalene, but doesn't, that doesn't mean he's saying that there's no one else there. There's no other women. In fact, when you read the next verse, when you read the next verse, this is what it says. Very interesting. So she ran and went to Simon Peter, the other disciple, and the other disciple, speaking of John, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Who's the we? Mary, who's the we? John, who's the we? It's the we is the other women. So let's just put some women on the screen, okay? We don't know who those women are yet. Let's see who they are. Well, if we read the other gospel accounts, let's start with Matthew. Matthew says that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were specific eyewitnesses of the empty tomb. It says this, now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. He doesn't say only they went to see the tomb. He just names those two people, okay? There could be other women, so let's just put them up there for a minute. Let's see what Mark has to say. Mark says this, when the Sabbath was, pa was passed, Mary Magdalene, the Mary, the mother of James, another Mary, it's a lot of Marys, okay, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Uh, and very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. So now we have Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome. But we already know that that other Mary is there too, according to Matthew. But maybe there's other women too. We don't know. Let's read Luke and find out. Luke, Luke's account doesn't conflict with the others, actually complements them by describing a larger list of women. Luke says this, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking spices that uh, they had prepared. If you jump to verse 10, it says this, Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna. Where did Joanna come from, right? No one mentioned her before. Joanna and, the Mar and Mary, the mother of James. So she's, she was listed in, in uh, Matthew as well. And the other women with them. The other women with them. So we already know who they are. At least Salome and that other Mary, right? And so we have here a list of women. Again, there's no contradiction here. There's no contradiction. We have at least five women named specifically. There may have been more. There's no contradiction. It's only a contradiction if you assume that selecting and naming individual women denies the other ones being there. Okay? And that, I think, is a false expectation. We see this also in, in the Gospels all over the place. Uh, what happens when they, the women tell Peter and John what happens. Well, if you read John, this is verse 3 and 4. Uh, it says, so Peter went out uh, with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb, but uh, both of them were running together. So they're running together at first, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. That is such a classic thing for a guy to include. You know John is talking about himself here, right? Yeah, we were running together at first, and then I just, like, blew past Peter, <laughs> right? That's awesome. And so, th th but notice, John includes himself and Peter. If you read Luke, though, you would get the sense that only Peter was there. Again, this is spotlighting. It says this, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, and then stooping in, and it goes on from there. So it just says, Peter ran there. It doesn't say anything about John. But if you read on, go from verse 12 uh, into verse 24. This is when the two men were on the road to Emmaus, and they're describing what's going on. It says this, some of those who were with us went to the tomb. Who were, who were they? So there was this group of people, uh, and we found it just as the women had said, okay? And so there's all these other people. At least John was there, probably others. How about accuracy? The next false expectation is that something, if it isn't precise, then it's not accurate. 
If it's not precise, then it's not accurate. But that is foolishness, okay? You can have something be imprecise but accurate. If I said it rained last week, that would not be precise. I didn't give you the day, the time, where, but it's accurate because it did rain last week, okay? Um, and so let me give you uh, an example here of something that's accurate but not precise. There was a sign that was uh, nailed to the cross above Jesus' head when they crucified him, okay? Depending on which gospel you read, you're going to get a different inscription, okay, on the on the, uh, the sign or the epitaph. And so here's what happens. You read John, and John says that this sign said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That's what John tells us. You read uh, Matthew, and it says, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. If you read Mark, it says, the king of the Jews. If you read Luke, the inscription says, this is the king of the Jews. There you go. See, all four Gospels can't agree on a simple, uh, short inscription. Obviously, they can't all be right. You want a contradiction? There it is. Case closed, right? But this, this is uh, banking on the false expectation that something being imprecise is not accurate. Let me try and make this more clear to you. Here are the four accounts from the Gospels. You'll notice that each one leaves something out, but you could actually piece together, you could actually harmonize all four inscriptions into one. And so John just says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Matthew says, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. Mark just says, the king of the Jews. And Luke says, this is the king of the Jews. If you put that all together, the inscription at least said, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Do you see how every single one of those inscriptions is accurate? Not precise. It's not giving a verbatim quote, but they are, they are accurate. Okay? They are accurate. And so, uh, and so we need to be careful on that false expectation. The third false expectation uh, is that conflicting summaries are errant uh, or, or, or in error. Okay? This fails to account for a literary device that many of you might not be aware of called time compression. A literary device called time compression. Bart Ehrman makes this mistake. Let me show you a clip. Just take a very simple example. Mark chapter 5 is an interesting story of Jesus healing the daughter of a, a man named Jairus. Jairus comes up to Jesus and he says uh, to Jesus, my daughter is ill, please come and lay your hands on her so you can heal her. And Jesus starts to go to, to, to see the girl, but he's interrupted on the way. And before he can get to the house, some servants come from the house and they tell, uh, tell Jairus, don't worry because she's dead already and there's no reason to bother the, the master anymore. Jesus says, that's not a problem. And he goes to the house, she's dead now, but he raises her from the dead. Beautiful story in Mark chapter 5. Matthew also tells the story in Matthew chapter 9. But in Matthew chapter 9, when Jairus comes to Jesus, he says to him, my daughter has just died. Can you do something? Now, wait a second. Now, in Mark's gospel, the girl hadn't died yet. She was sick, but she died when Jesus was delayed. But in Matthew, she's dead already. Well, which is it? Now, many of you are saying, who cares? <laughs> well, it's a little detail, but why is it different? It couldn't be both. It couldn't be both. It has to be one or the other or neither. All right, again, we have a, an alleged contradiction here. Uh, he says it couldn't be both. It has to be one or the other or neither. And so you guys... Um, let me put the verses on the screen. You guys hopefully understood the challenge there. In Matthew, you have uh, this, uh, this uh, ruler coming. We learned that it's, it's Jairus. He comes and says, my, my daughter's just died. Come make her well. But in Mark, she's not dead yet. She's not, well, what, she, she can't be dead and alive. 
What's, what's the deal? What's going on here? Well, uh, we got to get a couple things straight first. Uh, most of you are probably aware that the Gospel of Matthew is the longest gospel, okay? And uh, it's the longest gospel, but it has the shortest stories. It has the shortest stories. In fact, uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, is the shortest gospel, but has, the long, has longer stories. So when you look at the stories that both Matthew and Mark have, when you compare the stories, you can, you can see the difference. For example, this story here. If you count the words in the story, there's 139 words in Matthew's account. You read Mark's ca- account, the same story, it's 345 words. Eight verses compared to 22 verses, okay? More than double. Mark, Mark spends more than double the amount of time, uh, space, to, to recount the story. And so you can see there's, there's obviously going to be uh, some differences there. And so what happens? Well, Matthew jumps right into the story at the point where Jairus' daughter is already dead. He doesn't waste time. He, doesn't, he just cuts right to the chase. This is an example of, of uh, time compression. Sometimes it's called telescoping. I used a, mic, uh, a magnifying glass there. But telescoping, zooming in, okay, and picking certain things out. If you were to actually read the account in Mark, you would see... That, he, that, uh, that Matthew records, it says, my, my little daughter, uh, she's at the point of death. She's not dead yet. And then they go to heal the daughter, but then there's this story that's kind of inserted there where the woman who's got this hemorrhage, this bleeding disorder, and Jesus stops, ends up healing her. In fact, she touches them and some power goes out. You probably know the story. And then by the time that's done, the... the the uh, ruler's servants come up and say, Jairus, your daughter's already dead. Don't bother the guy. Don't bother Jesus. And then, so then at that point, she's dead, and Jesus goes and heals her, okay? And the story picks up. And so she's not dead, and then she dies in the course. Well, Matthew says, I'm not telling you all that stuff. She's dead. She's dead. Let's cut to the, you guys probably uh, could think of it this way. (laughs) Matthew, Matthew is the guy version. Right? It's the guy version. Mark, that's the girl version. Sorry, Mark. But that's the girl version of the story. You guys know what I'm talking about. The girl version gives you every little single detail. All the, and there's a lot of details, always. So she'll tell you what happened, when it happened, why it happened, how it happened, who was there, what they were wearing, what they said, what they thought, and how they felt, and how you should feel right? That's, that's Mark. That's Mark. But not, that's not Matthew. Matthew gets the bottom line. Here's the bullet points. Here's the Coles Notes version. That's how Matthew writes. Let me show you. Let me show you. Try not to get in in too much trouble here. Okay, so another example of time compression is found uh, in Matthew's account of cursing the fig tree. Cursing the fig tree. Here's how Mark tells the story, okay? Try and follow along. Monday morning, the disciples got up from Bethany, and they're going to head to Jerusalem, okay? Uh, As they were on their way, Jesus is hungry, and he sees a fig tree that has leaves on it. So they go over to see if there's any figs on the fig tree. There's There's no figs on the fig tree, so Jesus curses the tree, okay? He says, may no one eat ever eat from you again, okay, cursed it. They continue on to Jerusalem. They go to Jerusalem, they enter the temple. Uh, While Jesus is there, he drives out those people who bought and sold in the temple. He overturns the tables. Later in the evening, though, they leave the temple. This is Monday night. They leave the temple, and they head back to Bethany uh, to get some rest. The next day, Tuesday morning, They're on their way back to the city. They're on their way back to the temple, and they're passing the fig tree. And they notice, hey, it's completely withered up. Okay? And they say, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And then Jesus gives uh, a story there, and then he continues on into Jerusalem. That's Mark. That's Mark. You want to hear Matthew? Here's Matthew. Matthew says, Monday morning, 
get out of bed, leave from Bethany, head to Jerusalem. Jesus is hungry, sees the fig tree, no figs, curses it, head to Jerusalem. That's Matthew, okay? That's Matthew. You can tell. What happened there? Wait, I thought it was over two days. I thought he passed it, went into town, came back out. Next day they noticed it was, no, no, Matthew says, forget that. He saw the tree, no figs, cursed it, withered, and they moved on. Uh, Craig Blomberg, he was actually in town a couple of weeks ago, last weekend. Maybe it was two weekends ago. Um, and I uh, actually got to meet him, have uh, dinner at the same table with him. And uh, he says this, very interesting. He says, in his desire to create a neater literary narrative, Matthew puts uh, both parts of the fig tree story together, creating the illusion that it all took place in a single day. Still, Matthew never says this in so many words, and the language of immediate withering is still appropriate, even if it took place over several hours. Trees normally take much longer, far longer to decay. Okay, and so you can still make sense of the account, um, even though he's using time compression uh, in the, in the text. The fourth false expectation. Everyone got their idea about time compression there. The fourth uh, helpful principle is uh, is this. Well, the false expectation I should say first is that every time the events are ordered, it must be chronological. It must be chronological. So when events get all mixed up, everyone cries foul, right? That's, that's, a, that's a contradiction. Well, the decision by the author to order events by theme and content and not by chronology needs to be taken into consideration. In fact, when you read ancient uh, Greco-Roman biographies, which is the genre that the four Gospels are, uh, you see that they actually carried, cared little about chronology of events. They'll take a story and put it over here. Or, you know what, That's, this story would fit in right, really good right here. And so that happens all the time. Um, you may not be aware of it unless you're reading the stories kind of simultaneously and say, wait a second, how did this one didn't come first? It should have been this one first. And so you have to work that out. And so uh, thematic ordering is not chronological. Let me give you probably the most common challenge by uh, skeptics who like to bring up contradictions in the Bible. And this has to do with the temptations of Jesus. You know, Jesus in the wilderness, he is tempted. And anyone reading these accounts would immediately notice that Matthew and Luke have the second and third temptations in the reverse order, okay? Okay. So they each begin, Matthew and Luke both begin, with the temptation to turn stones into bread. That's the first temptation. Here's where things go south, okay? In Matthew, you have the second temptation as Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple, and Satan says, throw yourself down. Throw yourself down, your angels will rescue you. And then puts the last temptation, shows him the kingdoms of the world, and says, bow down and worship me and I'll give them all to you. If you read Luke, you'll see that that temptation is second, and the third temptation is on the pinnacle of the temple. Now, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Well, there's only a contradiction if the intent of Matthew and Luke was to record the temptations in chronological order. How, however, if the authors had a different purpose in mind, then there's no contradiction. Matthew is more concerned with faithfully recording the chronology. And you can see that, and the way Greek scholars would understand this, is when you look at the temptations, one, then two, then again, three, those words in between, then and again, those are sequential connecting words. One, then two. When you actually go through, you can try this at home, go through and read uh, the Luke account, you will see there's no than, there's only the word and, okay? Uh, in Greek, one of those is chi, okay? So, and that's a non-sequential connecting word. One and two and three. So Luke here, it seems, it appears, he doesn't really care about the order. He cares about the content, and he puts the temple at the end 
because his theme, one of the, the themes in Luke is the temple, okay? And so uh, I would argue that the first is chrono- in chronological order and the second is in more of a thematic order, okay? No contradiction unless you import, the reader imports uh, a misunderstanding, this wooden, everything must be chronological. If it's in the Bible, I start with chapter one, I end with, you know, chapter whatever, that's all chronological. For the most part, there is an order like that. They start with the birth narratives and they move to the death and resurrection of Jesus. So there is a overriding chronology, but not every story is in chronological order. And please keep that in mind um, when you read your Bible. Okay, so those are the four, the first four. I have one left, one left. Many of the apparent contradictions can be resolved using the text of Scripture itself. However, there are some difficulties that do not, we do not have enough information within the Scriptures themselves to uh, give a definitive solution, okay? So it's not always neat and tidy. And so for this final point, uh, a helpful principle, I would say mystery is not irreconcilable, okay? It's not impossible to reconcile. A mystery is not the same thing as a contradiction. A contradiction cannot be reconciled. A mystery can be. But uh, we may not know with certainty what that reconciliation is, okay? We may not know what it is. So uh, I want to give, give a quote here before I show you one particular um, mind-boggling uh, question. A.T. Robertson, he, he was a Bible scholar. Listen to his words. These are really good. He says this, In explaining a difficulty, it is always to be remembered that even a possible explanation is sufficient to meet the objector. Uh, if, if several possible explanations are suggested, it becomes all, mo- all the more reasonable for one to contend that the discrepancy is ir- uh, irreconcilable. So if you could give a possible explanation, not even one that we know for certain, just as a, it's a possible explanation, that destroys the, the contradiction, okay? That destroys the contradiction. So let me give you uh, Bart Ehrman for the last time, and then we'll try and deal with this, this contradiction. He in raised. both accounts, Jesus has a genealogy. The genealogy in Luke happens to come in chapter 3 after Jesus' birth, which is a strange place for a genealogy, but that's where it is. Luke chapter 3. Read the genealogy in Luke and read the genealogy in Matthew and ask yourself, who is allegedly Jesus' father in both? What's well, Joseph? Okay. Both genealogy traces Joseph's bloodline. And so, who is Joseph's father? It's different in Matthew and Luke. Who's his grandfather? different in Matthew and Luke. Who's his great-grandfather? Different in Matthew and Luke. The genealogies are different between Joseph all the way back to King David. And both genealogies claim to be giving the genealogy of Joseph. (coughs) Why is that? Well, they probably had different sources, and, you know, they, they probably didn't know. They had sources that gave them genealogy. Genealogy are odd, but they can't be historically accurate because they're different. You have one father. You don't have two fathers. Well, maybe he was adopted by somebody, and so he had a stepfather. Yeah, maybe. So even Bart offers a possible, ex- kind of a random possible explanation right at the end. Um, but let's, let's go through that. So you can see the challenge here. Uh, I copied the names from Matthew and Luke, and he's, Bart's right. If you go back, I mean, it says, one says Joseph was the son of Heli, and then you go back to the grandfather and so on, all the way to King David, and actually there's more people on that side. You read Matthews, well, it says Jacob is the father of Joseph, a different grandfather all the way back, and you'll see there's a different number there. In fact, here's another, suppose, I can't get into it, contradiction, but if you count the genealogies, there's, it's like 14, 14, and four, there's a three 14s. But when you go back to the Old Testament and look at the genealogies, there's some people missing from this genealogy. What's up with that? I'm going to leave you hanging with that one. Maybe with Q&A time we'll talk about it. But let's answer this question. Uh, Here's a possible explanation. Here's a possible explanation. Uh, One is that Jacob is the father of Joseph, 
And Heli is actually the, the, the father of Mary, but Heli didn't have any sons. And so, uh, and so Joseph would have been the legal heir to the family there, the legal heir to, to actually all of Heli's possessions. And so he would have got his inheritance. And so he was his father-in-law. In fact, in the Greek, there's no word for son-in-law, okay? There's just son. And so maybe that's a possible explanation. Maybe. But here's a really cool one. I had to show this to you, okay? If you go back uh, and read Eusebius, Eusebius actually was, uh, was between um, the late 3rd century, early 4th century, and he quotes something called the Epistle of Africanus, okay? We know that Julius Africanus lived in the late 2nd century, to early 3rd century. And this is what Julius Africanus said. you got to listen to this. Eli, which is Heli, Heli and Jacob were thus uterine brothers. Huh? They came from the same uterus, is what he's saying. Okay? They came from the same uterus. Heli, having died childless, Jacob raised up seed to him, begetting Joseph, uh, his own son by nature, but by law, the son of Heli, thus Joseph uh, was the son of both. Now, let me explain this to you, okay? And this took me a while to do, okay? This, I think this took me like three hours to create, so enjoy for the next three minutes. Okay, so you have Methan. Methan marries, takes a wife, and they have a son, and that son is Jacob, Okay? It's very tragic. Methan dies. Methan dies. His wife remarries Methat. I mean, because you only have to change one letter in the name, right? So that's easy. And Methat, of course, has his own genealogy there. And so this new wife, through remarriage, and they have a son. And that son's name is Heli. Okay? Now we're getting one step closer, right? Because now we can say Jacob and Heli are half-brothers, half-brothers. They are brothers from the same uterus, okay? All right, so that makes sense of the first part. Now, Heli takes a wife. Heli takes a wife. Now, Heli dies without having any kids, okay, on this view. And it, according to the Mosaic Law, according to Deuteronomy 25, you guys know what has to happen, right? He has no kids. Heli has no sons. Well, Jacob's his brother, and so Jacob has to give Heli offspring to carry on his line. This is what it says. This is what Deuteronomy says. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother, that would be Jacob, shall go into her, and take her as his wife and perform the duties of a husband's brother to her. And this is the important point. And this first son, and the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of the dead brother. It's like it's Heli's son, okay? Uh, that is the name, that his name may not be blotted out from Israel. And so you can see here, they have a son, Joseph. And Joseph is the legal heir of Heli, according to Deuteronomy 25. But he came from Jacob. And so Jacob is the biological father. Is that not wild? This is like Jerry Springer stuff, right? <laughs> and so, did I just date myself? Probably the young people are like, who's that? Who is that guy? And so here you have, here you have, uh, Joseph's, Joseph's father by law is Heli, but by nature is Jacob. And that's exactly what Julius Africanus said in like the second century, okay? That's kind of neat. So can we say with certainty that this is the proper harmonization of the genealogy of Matthew and Luke? I have no idea, okay? I can't say that with certainty. But is it possible? Is it a possible solution? Uh, yes. 
And that's enough to demonstrate that this is not a bona fide contradiction. It's not a genuine contradiction, okay? You with me? Now, you can see why if someone comes to your door or you're, you know, you're out for lunch with someone, they say, man, contradiction in the Bible. And you say, name one. And they say, well, you know, Joseph had two fathers. This might be a little, you know, you can't just give a one-word answer to that kind of challenge, right? This takes a second to break down. And so since we can explain this alleged contradiction, it is uh, unreasonable for one to contend that the discrepancy is irreconcilable, okay? We met the objector, which is what A.T. Robertson said. Uh, so this may be a, mi a mystery. I think it is a mystery, and we probably will never know the answer, uh, but it's, it's definitely not a real contradiction. And so here we have, in this short time, answered these, these false expectations. False expectations come from a modern reader that, uh, that lead to that lead to false claims of contradiction. Certainly, the biblical authors do not give us all the details that we want. Sometimes they're selective. With all the mathematical precision that we want, sometimes they're still accurate but not precise. With all the exact time frame that we want, sometimes they write with time compression. And it's not always in the order that we would expect. Sometimes it's not chronological, right? And so, and, so, and then sometimes it's just a mystery. But that doesn't mean that the authors got it wrong. That doesn't mean they contradicted themselves. I want to leave you with this. I, be, I, don't, I don't believe there's any real contradictions in the Bible. I believe that all the alleged contradictions, and we've seen there are quite a few alleged contradictions, can be explained. They can be explained, or else they're mystery. But for the sake of argument, let's just assume that there is contradictions in the Bible. Let's just assume that for the sake of argument. What follows from that? What follows from that? If the four gospel writers all contradicted each other about the sign above Jesus' crucified head, would that mean Jesus was never crucified? No. It wouldn't mean he didn't die on the cross. Um, if, if the women went to the tomb, that was, that, those were a genuine contradiction. How many women? Was it one? Was it two? Was it three? Was it more? If that was a real contradiction, would that mean that the tomb wasn't empty? No. No. It would not discount the empty tomb. Of course not. Even if all, even if uh, these side details are a contradiction, it would not mean that Jesus didn't rise from the dead either. Okay? Now what that would raise, it would raise questions about inerrancy, which I hold to. Um, it would raise questions about that, but it would not mean Christianity is not true, and it wouldn't mean that the Bible is unreliable. In fact, listen, we started with this illustration. Some eyewitnesses said the Titanic sank in one piece. Others said it went down, it broke in two, and then sank. But no one in their right mind would conclude that, therefore, the Titanic never sank, right? Or that it never existed, or something like that. That's crazy. That's crazy. And so in the same way, just if there were contradictions, things that could not be explained, um, it would not mean that the Bible is unreliable, as Bart Ehrman seems to think.